Hello and welcome to today's webcast, Taking Your CPD Programs Online, Tips for Educational Webinars. My name is Vesna, I'm from Redback and I'll be your host for today's session. Professional development is an important part of any membership organisation, but how can we innovate our programs and engage our members to stand out from the rest? Today, we're joined by Sarah Gonzalez and Michael Bunker. They're here to shed some light on everything related to digital CPD. How are you both today? Great, Very thank you good, for having you. us. That's great. So let's get straight into it. We know how webinars play a role in most organisations, but Michael, what role do they play in associations? In the association space, CPD are an expected association function, whether it be a physical or a digital event. And from this, we can see that 72.3% of association members uh, rate on the education and webinars as valuable for it. I think it's also important to note that, you know, for a long time we've been talking about um, digital and online and when it does come to using webinars to facilitate um, between associations and members, it would never replace that face-to-face no. -face element. No. So today is really about utilising different ways on how we can improve the online experience for everyone, but also remembering that there is a blended approach and we will go into that a little bit later. Um, but, yeah, I think it's great to see that from a lot of the... Um, feedback we've yep. got from people in terms of the function of an association, they do actually say that online education and webinars are hugely important compared to everything else as well. So that's, I think that's reassuring for everyone. Very reassuring. Yeah, yeah. they definitely go hand in hand. Yep. And uh, we've recently looked at all our customers who ran online CPD in 2016 and we came up with a facts and facts report which can be found in the resources folder. Sarah, when it comes to attendance, what did we find? Um, the biggest thing was this, and this, this was really interesting because we had no research to date when it did come to online CPD and no research within Australia as yeah. well. So we've sort of taken a step back, looked at every single one of our um, customers who have used online CPD in some form, and then we've actually analysed all their events ran over um, 2016. So in 2016, at the beginning of the year, we actually did the Redback report. So corporates, product launches, um, government departments, yep. you know, different purposes. Mm -hmm. 40 to 50 percent of those, sorry, with those events, they only had a 40 to 50 percent attendance rate on something. So whether it's marketers using it, like I said, government departments or any other body. When it comes to associations and CPD applications, they actually had a much higher attendance rate. So long story short, if you're running CPD programs, you're more likely to get more people joining online in that live environment. And as you can see there, you've got 79.5% attendance rate for people paying for your events. So obviously if you're charging for something yeah. and you're paying that you want to actually join Attended, live, yeah. um, and then you have a 59% attendance rate for those um, joining in a free environment. Um, um, also interesting to note that when it came to, to duration, so this is the length of time that your attendees will spend on your webinars, most people in the paid side of things, they actually spent 90% of that whole hour wow. or two hours online, which yeah. is huge. So not only are you getting 79.5% of people actually attend at some stage, they're also staying online they're not getting preoccupied, they're actually enjoying the content, they're not actually just logging off because they feel like it. And I mean, that's quite a big expectation as well, two hours. I mean, I would have thought that maybe the 60-minute events would have a much higher uh, event duration for participants actually logging on. But for two hours, it's mm. really fascinating to see that some really interesting findings in there. And we'll go into that a little bit more. And I think it is interesting because, like you said, a lot of people think, oh, no one's going to sit online for that long. But what you actually find is there are a lot of advantages of having longer webinars. Yeah, most definitely. And um, so for the length of events, so we said that people that stay on for two hours actually stay on the longest. But what other things did we find as well in regards to the duration of the events? Yeah, so I want to go through this quickly because we are going to discuss, okay, so what What does this mean in a moment? Um, but let's first look at 30-minute events. So here's um, people holding events that are going for 30 minutes uh, for CPD programs. As you can see, only 1% of our customer base actually ran CPD events for 30 minutes. So they aren't very popular. And I think that's because people want education and people want to actually sit there. And 30 minutes isn't a long time to yeah. actually digest yeah. a lot of this information. And for some of the industries as well, you can't actually accumulate that many points doing a 30-minute mm. session. So the yep. hour block and above, you can get more points for. So that's why the trend kind of points to that direction as well. Yep. However, what we did see is they did have a high attendance rate. So if you are charging for events and they're running for 30 minutes, that's the average attendance right there um, and 87% of attendees actually stayed online for the full 30 minutes. Going into 60 minute 60 minute webinars now, so this is the most popular side. A lot of people actually run events that go for 60 minutes. 35% um, of our customers actually did this time um, 
duration in terms yeah. of their webinars. They did have a lot of people staying online, so you can see there the percentage of attendees who actually did stay online. But if you are running a free event, the attendance isn't actually that high as well. So more people are thinking, OK, maybe I'll just wait for the on-demand to come out. Let's look at 90 minutes. Once again, a really high attendance rate for those free events and paid people who actually charge in for these events that are running for 90 minutes, 90% 90 of those people stayed online. Now, I really want to um, just want everyone to keep that in mind because as we go into this a little bit further yeah. into the so what, who cares, 90% is a long time for people to stay online. Yeah. But what's happening with that other 10%? So you do have people 90% online for 90% of the time, but at the end of your event, you've got 10% of people logging off. So what's actually happening then? Your feedback, your surveys, your quizzes, a whole range of things. So we need to start thinking about how we can work that into our online events to enhance them. And here we go, 120 uh, minutes. So this is the longest one. So a two hour webinar, can actually be a long time for a lot of people, yeah. but some of our customers actually have breaks in between. So what that means, okay, we've done 60 minutes, go grab a coffee, yep. stretch your legs, come back, and these accounted for 33% of the events that were held in 2016. Funny enough, they were all paid. Oh, so wow. yeah. every single person who did run an event, a webinar, CPD related, that didn't run for two hours, only ran them as paid events. They weren't free at all. And this also had the highest duration, even though it is the longest time to be online. So just a few interesting stats there. Yeah, and so speaking of duration with the 30, uh, 60, 90 minutes, 120 minutes, yeah. what does that all tell us about the CPD trends? What can we learn from that and how can we apply that to our events? I think the biggest thing is that we need to um, know our audience and understand that CPD is different to a lot of other applications. Yes. So within one organisation, um, a lot of a, a lot of um, associations are actually running webinars for a variety of different things, yep. and CPD programs might only be a portion of those. Mm -hmm. But we need to start treating them differently, um, and people are willing to stay online and learn. You know, it's not just about getting people online so they can do it through their lunch break. They're paying for these yep. events. They know they're going to get accredited. So we need to start thinking about the fact that we need to make them a little bit longer at times, but also understanding that we need to start using different tools and stuff to make it a bit more exciting. Otherwise, you know, after 12 months of running the same things, <laughs> yes. it can get a bit boring. Um, and the other thing, like I said, um, that we're going to discuss later is really catering to those people who are dropping off. Yes. So you've got those people staying online for 90% of the time. However, what then happens for the rest of it and how can we make that part of our overall yeah. plan? Yeah. And I think a lot of that has to come down to with the market or who you're going to, your audience, what are the metrics that they actually get their CPD points for? So if they only need to be online for that 90% of the time, they don't need, they don't have any reward for staying on for that Q&A part. So by having clear metrics of how they're going to actually get their points, it doesn't mean they have to be on there 100% of the time. If you clearly outline at the beginning, you can keep your audience online, but it's all about how they engage with the platform. We'll get into some features and functionalities a little later on to talk about how you can engage with the audience. But each different industry out there for profession, the way they're marked on this is different. So you need to design your program around how you can actually accredit the people for joining. Exactly. Yeah, and speaking of features, I think it's a really important thing to actually look into that and see how that plays a role in CPD and how it can actually enhance. So um, before we get into tips and tricks, yeah. um, and Michael is our webcasting expert, so <laughs> he will be uh, all over that. But yeah. uh, what can you tell us about the platform features and what you can do with all the different things that we have? Well, we'll get onto that in just a moment. Mm. I really first just want to cover off, and I know a lot of people online right now really want to talk about the revenue benefits of doing this. And again, this isn't something to replace your face-to-face -face events. Mm. This is an accompaniment. This is something that you can run parallel with them to reach your database or your membership that can attend those physical events. So you do need to have two strategies for it. But we've got a couple of customers up here that have delivered events with Redback Conferencing, and we'll look at how they invested, what they invested to their returns. So we can see customer one, they invested $4,515. Their return was 6,301, which was a profit of 1,786, which was a good profit after like a small series, just yeah. dipping their toes in the water. But we can see with the next couple of customers, they invested a lot more money, but their return was a lot greater. So customer number two invested 23,000, return was 73,000. It's a $50,000 profit for running these events. Now these are not, now some of these figures don't encounter the cost of speakers and stuff, but we'll get into the speakers and what their benefits are doing for this. But we can see here a big return on investment for these ones. The last one, now they've invested a very substantial amount and their program was about online delivery of events. So they were gonna invest a lot into it and we can see here that they'd invested $187,000 
return was 670000 which was a profit of 483 which is almost half a million mm. yeah, as a profit that's... for return on investment. I cool. think it's um, the biggest thing here. Obviously, people are making money out yes. of their events, and it is a revenue generator. Um, but I think what we need to um, really emphasize is the fact that if you go out there and you want to use this as a yes. revenue generator for part of your organization, then you need to start thinking about programs and doing yes. one webinar and having that to see how it goes and not you know, thinking <laughs> of a long-term strategy over, say, 12, 18 or 24 yeah. months can be quite dangerous. And it is, you know, you can tip your toe in the water, like you said, and have a little turn, but don't expect to see a huge outcome. No. It is more about, you know, the more you invest in it, the more time you put in and yes. the more, um, I guess, aware and excited as you make your members about it, the yeah. more they can then start to be part of your program. And then before you know it, you've built that community. Yes. So I think that's also important. And I think that's the biggest thing as well. Your community and how you're reaching an audience and using webinar as a platform to do that is it's, it's not a one event solution. You're not going to gain an audience from one event. Word of mouth has to travel. You have to go around to your all your members or the people that you're providing this training to, but you do need to have a clear plan and you do need to have a full series booked in so you can see from first event to the last event how you're able to grow that, how you're going to get people in different channels using social media and other methods for that, but you do need to commit to a chunk and not just a bite. Board. Yeah, most yeah. definitely. And I think that applies to all webinar programs. It's not just with CPD, but it's very important because if your members are logging on for face uh, for coming in for face-to-face -face events, they want to know that those online resources are there yeah. as well. And it's not just going to come in once and then it's gone and all the benefits mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So um, now we'll jump onto the platform features. features. Nice. So uh, what can you tell us about the platform features and what's useful, what works, what doesn't work? Well, I think the biggest shock to this was people don't really use much of the features for CPD. Mm. Yeah. They're still very, because I guess a lot of actual physical CPD events still are just persons standing up there and presenting a PowerPoint. Not really that much. And they kind of carry that same face-to-face -face mentality into web. Mm. And forgetting you can do a lot more in a web-based environment. So we can see here that only 33% uh, actually use the polling and surveys. And none of them use the presence manager, which I think for anyone in this space where you have to do mandatory CPD points and actually prove that people people are online, that presence manager is the only clear definitive way you can prove someone was watching the screen yeah. and not turning around and just listening to the audio and maybe doing the emails, but they were actually present, they were engaged, and they were interacting with your system. Although I think one good thing that we did see come out of this report that yeah. we're talking about is the fact that the average number of polls is four, yeah. and then the average numbers, number people are using surveys within it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll go into polling and what that is um, shortly. However, just for everyone out there, I think um, if you've used polling or maybe you haven't, it is a way of receiving feedback from your online attendees. And I think in the past people were going in using one poll because they thought to ha they thought they had to get in some feedback and then moving on and one thing we've always said if you are going to use polling be consistent and use it often so yes. maybe at the beginning maybe two in the middle to see yeah. um, if people are understanding the learning objectives and then also at the end as well to wrap up so the fact that people I think have taken that on board yes. and they are doing an average of four is really exciting and it gives us optimism I think for the future and plus people are using in-room surveys as well which is another feature which we'll go into in a moment. Perfect. Yeah, definitely. So it's obviously about education and knowing what's available and what works for different people. So we've got the stats and facts from the new report that we've created. What does it all mean if we delve into it? Mm. What can we learn from the stats and facts? Okay, so there's the report, there's the stats, <laughs> everything's been analysed. Yes. Now let's talk about what it actually means for you, um, everyone watching. So we've got all the data there. A few things that have come out of it, which is what we're going to into, go into now, is the fact that paid attendants have a high attendance rate. Yes. We all know that. And we are, you know, looking at different ways to sort of enhance those and to um, increase the functionality of these events. We need to look at ways that we can obviously cater to those people who are staying online for 90% of the time and maybe incorporating some more interactive features beforehand um, and we really want to talk to people about how to get their program off the ground if you've never done CPD before or you are looking to refresh your program next year and also let's go into the platform a little bit as well because I think there's so much to cover when it actually um, comes to the features yeah. the functionality and stuff that people don't even know exists. So, yeah, great. Uh, when it comes to creating your events, where do we begin? Okay, so let's start right back at the beginning um, because I understand that there may be different people at different levels online. So first thing is to really think about what you're going to create. So in order to do this, I think a lot of people just assume they don't actually look outside of their organisation yeah. to listen to what their members are talking about, what other events they're attending in the industry yeah. and also who's being talked about. So within your industry, 
there's so many experts out there, subject matter experts who may be really, really famous within your organisation and your industry, yep. or some unknown people who are saying and doing a lot of exciting things. And this is your chance to actually get them in front of the camera and to get them talking to your members. So really take a look outside of your organisation. Look at your competitors. That's... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But also then listen to other people within your organisation. So I think the biggest mistake we do when we do talk about these CPD events is we go out and we, we are a CPD manager or where someone actually assisting to deliver yeah. it with another department and we're not talking to anyone else so we're sort of letting the marketing team do their thing we're letting your membership officers do their their thing you know a lot of people out there are actually um, still using telephone as a way yes. to engage members and to even get feedback from them or call them up and find out about their membership yeah. These are the people who are talking to your members on a regular basis. So let's start asking everyone on, in the organisation what's happening, go onto LinkedIn, look at your discussion yep. groups and then create your program. So then think about the content you're going to create and build it around that. Think of evergreen content. Um, so evergreen content is a way, is really just content that lives on for a lot longer and that also plays into your on-demand strategy as well. You need to also look at the times and when are people in your industry actually going to be more available to yep. attend these events. So if you are, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, doctors, if they're your main target market or maybe um, people in professional services, is during the day actually best for them? Are they going to be able to take an hour or maybe two hours out to actually sit down and pay attention? And then you also need to start thinking about how you're going to collect this data and what you're going to do with the data as well, as well as your on-demand strategy. So there's a whole range of things we need to yeah. think about. We're going to break it down now um, <laughs> and creation in terms of the first steps this is where it all this is where it all happens and it's about planning and making sure that you get the planning right to begin with yep. so we always say to create compelling content Yep. And that's, the, you know, the three C's, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you look down in the resources folder, there's a guide which is just on creating compelling content and that actually goes a lot deeper. Um, but th these are the rules that we basically say um, just from the programs that we've run in the yep. past and also organisations who have actually got it right. Keep it educational. Look at what you've got. A lot of organisations have so many different ways of delivering content, whether it's written content, whether it's videos, whether it's membership surveys. Take all that information and start to think about how you can adapt it into the online world. Also think about alternative content. So a lot of people think of stuff that's really specific to the people who they're talking to, which is great. But then we need to start thinking a bit uh, wider. So in terms of expanding our reach, which is something else we'll go into, as, an, as a, someone who's delivering education, are you just limiting yourself? So yeah. there's so many different topics out there that are really relevant and people want to hear about. Think about mental health. Think about wellness in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Think about anything that's got to do with maybe your finances or something like that that you can tie back to. So think about stuff that isn't just industry specific. Yeah, so you have personal professional development, which is one side, and then you're the personal development yes. of the members as yeah. well, which is a great lead generating exercise, which we will yeah. talk about a bit. Um, and then also the why. So why are you delivering, delivering this and what are your goals and how are you going to measure this success? So I think for a lot of people, they go out there, it's like, well, I want to help reach my members yeah. and that's great but so does everyone yes. at the end of the day. So you need to start really taking a step back and talk to other people within your organisation, like I said, and start figuring out what your purpose is as a membership organisation, what your strategy is, and then how are webinars going to contribute to this in terms of the grand scheme of things, because then you'll be able to see your investment go a lot further. Um, and then break it down as well. So really start to think about the online platform with the tools we're going to go into, um, and then think about presenters and who you can get online to help yeah. you achieve this. And I think um, you were saying before, you know, a great thing is to work with your presenters yes. and perfect them over Well, that's time. it. Well, everyone's got some great presenters and you have their physical event presenters who are very engaging and they can walk up and down the room and they can be on a lapel and they can see people interacting. But these might not be the presenters best for online delivery. Yep. And we've yep. seen it a thousand times before where they are very charismatic and energetic, but you put them behind a camera or a laptop and they just freeze. Yep. Yeah. So you need to try and test your presenters before you actually get them involved. So it's finding out have they done it before if so, see if you can find some footage of them or a recording of a previous one they've done. Inspect before you buy if you are having to purchase your presenters. But as we can see here, um, 
and we'll get to it in just a moment, but like, I'll take a step back. So make sure that they're on board, they're passionate about doing it. You want to find people that are really enthusiastic about the topics. That's yeah. the number one thing. People rate a presenter on enthusiasm and passion over anything else, and that's what we found in the Redback Report. And that's going to carry through to your CPD delivery as well. If you have someone that is larger than life, effervescent, and not um, hindered by the fact that they are using technology, you'll have a winner there. Yeah. The next thing is educate and inspire. So you need to just make sure that they're not just reading off of the slides, but they maybe have dot points. It's not just a bunch of text on the screen. They need to actually be inspiring and educating. Have it that the slides are kind of broken down a little bit more and maybe have a white paper attached to it, which has the more detailed information for it. You want to have people that are intrigued and have follow-up steps for it. Location, location, location. So depending on where your presenters are, great thing about digital technology is you can have presenters from anywhere in the world, but you do want to try and test their platforms and make sure there's not yeah. going to be any uh, pitfalls or downfalls with them presenting remotely or look for a presenter that has facilities where they can come in and utilize studios for the delivery. So again, think about the technology. It really does hurt when you've got presenters out in rural Australia who are amazing people, but the technology here isn't the best. Maybe use phone lines tied into the web conferencing platform to be able to deliver your event for it. And alignment. That's probably the biggest thing It's talking about with the organizer, the marketing team, and the presenter. They all have to be on the same page. There's nothing worse than you joining a webinar or a digital event, and the presenter starts talking about a different a CPD program or a different topic that's similar to the title, but they're not 100% aligned. People, if they're buying it, want to know exactly what they're coming into, and you need to make sure that your presenter, organizer, marketing team are all on the same page for that. And then what's their investment? Some, uh, some organizations provide CPD points to the presenters for actually presenting, so they get yeah. them that way if they're inside that space. Some people actually charge for it as well. It really depends on how much you're willing to invest, but what you can offer them for them taking their time out to present on your CPD program. Mm. And mm. I think in terms of, you know, when, when it's all happening, so obviously we need to understand the time and date. We get feedback from members, and it's yeah. stuff that we've been told for a long time now. Obviously we need to try and test and make sure that we're constantly evolving in terms of our webinar programs. However, I think the two biggest things that have come out um, in the last 12 months that we've actually seen that has been great for so many organisations in terms of innovating their programs, the bundling yes. and also the pre and post marketing. So this really comes down to um, if you are charging for an event, consider bundling. And a lot of people can be against this. I think there's a lot of this whole sleazy sales thing that a lot of people assume, you know, yeah. buy two, get one free yeah. set of steak knives. However, it can actually work in your favour if you start to think about it. So let me, um, as an example, um, I'm out there and I'm going to market to my members and say this event will cost you $65 and you'll get 10 CPD points out there. However, if you purchase um, the next six months and you get this many CPD points, it may only cost you, say, $500 and you might get a bit of a discount. However, if you go out there and now start thinking about organisations and thinking within one organisation, you could potentially have 10 different members in there yes. or other people who are interested in your content, start thinking about what we call organisational tickets. So this is where you actually go out there and you say, okay, $65 for one person to view. However, if you buy 10 tickets and that gives you 10, an organisational ticket where 10 people can view this, that is only going to cost you $500. Now, obviously, all those people can get onto the webinar, no yes. matter what, because all it is is an email address for a lot of people and it might have a secure code. But it is the mentality of a lot of people out there thinking, oh, well, I'm actually buying this as one member. I'm not going to share it with anyone else because <laughs> yeah. I've invested out of my pocket to actually attend this, so I'm not going to share it. But if you do start thinking of an organisation and how you can leverage off that and perhaps times your you know, in, uh, revenue by 10, then that's a different way. And that's when you also start to embed yourself in an organisation with your members. And I think the last thing is utilising pre and post. So um, when you are promoting your webinars and you do send an invitation and we do actually say try and keep it dedicated. So if you have an event coming up next week, send a ded dedicated email invitation for that. But also think about, you know, once people register and it says, okay, thank you for submitting, what can you put on that page? How can you promote your series? How can you promote your next event? And then start thinking about when people receive the confirmation email. Yep. What can you also put down the bottom? Something, you know, want to know more about joining members, being a member, sorry, if yep. you are currently not a yep. member and you are charging um, non-members. Or maybe start thinking about how you can then encourage people to sign up to more that you have. And that also goes um, hand in hand for once you close down your webinar and maybe the last slide is up and the presenter is talking advertise your next webinar. When people close out, use your exit URLs to push out to your events page or maybe um, actually get people to register for a face-to-face -face event 
and that's yeah. where the whole blended thing comes in. And then also, even when you send out the recording, which is a whole other level, yes. then you can, that's a perfect opportunity out of every single email that's sent out throughout the email marketing phase for online events. So that's your invitation, your confirmation, your reminder and your recording email. By far, the recording email will have the highest open rate. Yep. That's what we found. And so within that, there's such an opportunity to actually start putting additional information in there that can then help um, your members find out more about you, find out more about your programs. And that's when we can actually start to see these programs evolve and people just start signing on and on and on. And it's like this just always be promoting. Yes. In yeah. as many op don't, don't think of it as that sleazy sales pitch idea. Start thinking of it as a, as a value and it's your job to actually help people get onto these events. Most definitely. And it doesn't always have to be a really kind of salesy watch this, do this. Yes. You can think of banners, you can think of lower thirds on yeah. your emails. There's all sorts of things where you can just kind of embed little pictures yeah. and all sorts of different things with it. So you can really, yeah, you can get really creative with your content and in, when you exit an event, mm. there are banners on the top. Yeah. There's, yeah, videos. Exactly. Great. So when it comes to marketing CPD events, is that any different to marketing other events? Well, you know I love talking about marketing, <laughs> so I'll take this one. Um, some of it we just touched on, so that's a promotion of being able to um, cross-promote as much as possible. That also ties into any content that you're send, sending out, not just online content. But essentially, CPD events, yes, they are very similar. However, okay. you may have a smaller market to actually market to. Um, but I really, really encourage, and Michael touched on this um, just a few moments ago, is that alignment with everyone else. So yeah. a lot of people who are promoting CPD events within organisations aren't responsible for the rest of the marketing. And I think we're making a huge mistake out there if we're just keeping separate and yeah. we're just doing our own yeah. thing and we're not talking to one another and it's easier said than done because we're like oh well of course we communicate in our yeah. organization that's what we do we're great at it but if you don't have the same plan same plans and if you as an organizer of your cpd programs don't know what your marketing yeah. department yeah. has planned for the next 12 months there's no way that you're going to be able to create a seamless marketing plan for your cpd program so think about what's already happening sit down with your marketing yeah. team yeah. look at their content plan for the next 12 months try and see how you can leverage in that if possible yeah. so think about about how it's happening as well. If your marketing team uses social media and they've got over 100,000 followers on their LinkedIn page and you're not tapping into that to advertise your events, then there's something missing. Why, and there's why huge aren't you doing that yet? <laughs> but do you know what? We don't. We get so busy and we sit in front of our computer and we all have yeah. objectives and we have stuff to do and so we don't talk to other people or it's like, hi, bye, we're not actually talking yeah. about the finer things. Um, and then consider lead generation. So, of course, this is for educational purposes when we do talk about CPD, but think about lead generation, which can automatically happen. So. Yeah. A lot of associations, they've been doing this for about two years now. We've just done some case studies on them with some of our partners. They've been running uh, membership CPD programs and they're free. They're not okay. charging for them. Yeah. However, they are going out and they're charging for people who aren't currently members. Right. So what that does is that's huge brand exposure for people out there. It's huge revenue generation. But then for that organisation, those non-members are now in their database and they're part of their community. So that's lead gen because they can constantly nurture them and try and get them to become a member if they're showing them value, of course. Yeah. So that's another thing that a lot of people don't even realise. That, that is happening. true. And we, yeah, looking at the features and functionalities, especially the end marketing URL, dropping people back off the, the member mm. benefit page. If you know that you have 29% of your users of the year are non-members, that's a pool of people that you could be going to a sales guy saying, hey guys, these are the contact details of this, go for it. Like try to get them on board, show mm. them the true value. It's only going to get them a better rate when they're attending your actual webinars, but it's also getting someone back into that other area of your business yeah. where you do have marketing, webinars, sales. Everything actually is all kind of working together, but unless they're all on the same page as you said, mm. you don't know that they are. Yep. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is to create a plan. And everyone knows this, um, but actually sometimes, you know, you want to do a webinar, or you've got four weeks to go, the presenter just got back to you, you need to get everything together, you just go out and you just get it done yes. because sometimes yes. we just have to. But as much as possible, even if it's just a time and date, that's going to be consistent for the next 12 months. Have it down in writing and make sure that you let your organiser know or the company that you're dealing with who's running your webinars that these are the dates that we're having them. You know, things get booked up, anything can happen <laughs> as these events become more popular. So start thinking about planning something um, as much as possible, but obviously if time permits. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. So we looked at it before, uh, the platform. Not many people, are, oh, well, around 30% of people are using the polls, surveys yep. and presence manager. 
Uh, can we just break that down a little bit and actually look at what the features are and how they can be used? Sure can. So the first thing we're going to look at right now is the polling. And so we can see a lot of people are using this. And they're using it a couple of times yep. in there. But a lot of people use it as just uh, icebreakers at the beginning. And it's like, okay, tell me what state you're coming from or tell me yes. about this. So they get to find out where the audience is coming from. But again, you're losing out on a huge opportunity of what that functionality can actually do. So polling functionality, what it does is you're asking a question to your general audience and you're finding out that information, but if you're running a series of events and you're utilizing the same polls each time, you're starting to build audience data. And this can be really powerful, especially when you're starting to split it up for education pieces. So you're doing an education session with four topics and you rate the level of understanding of each of the topics by using a poll at the beginning mm -hmm. of it. If you do that for every single one at the beginning and the end, at the end of your series, you can go out to your market saying, hey, 80% of our online attendants for our CPD program say they have a greater level of understanding coming out of a webinar that we deliver. Instantly, you use that in your social media campaigns. Click here to register for upcoming events. It's a new marketing tool for you, but it's also an interactive and engaging tool to make sure people are looking at your screen mm. as well. When you're asking people questions, they'll pay attention. The chat box, people use this generally as just for presenters, sorry, participants to ask questions to the presenters, but the presenters can use this as well to ask questions to their audience. Yeah. And I think they forget to do that. It's like at the very beginning, it's like, hey guys, on this topic, I'm gonna ask a question out. First, first person in, let me know, say, what is the value of something? The first person in, you get to go say, oh, Marianne, you're correct. The answer was X. Again, that's just going to break down the wall of the technology. You're calling people by their name. You're pulling people through. But you can use that chat box for other than just getting questions. Yeah, and questions. I think a lot of the times people, um, because people are still quite, a lot of people are still quite new to online events, yeah. they'll get in maybe 15, 10 minutes early before it actually starts because yeah. there's this whole perception of, oh, I need to get my seat. I need to hop in the yeah. webinar. And it's actually really, I think it's great that people do yeah. that. But while they're sitting there, get your presenter or facilitator, and we've done this sometimes, to start engaging and having a chat. and. Yeah potentially even other members talking to each other, which is always good. And that's it. And I think also look at the functionality of, do you want it open or do you want it privatized? Mm. Both have benefits to it. So if you don't want to have everyone seeing other questions coming through and you want to moderate, especially the chat box, and for the educational stuff, I would never recommend it because you kind of want to build that community mm. atmosphere. This is the people who are signing up for a series, so they're going to start to get to know each other and even some of your regular presenters. So why not make that an engaging, engaging area of it where at the very beginning you can have people in there, you can post questions to them before the, the session even starts, and just get them talking with each other. And people will get a lot more comfortable when they do know each other and they'll be asking a lot yeah. more questions. They'll just be a lot friendlier and yeah. you find that when you get along with the people that you're speaking with, the ideas just yeah. kind of flow. That's it's a user so experience. It's, it's a, yeah, exactly yeah, that. You want to make it an engaging, fun user experience. Yeah. Otherwise, people aren't going to be coming back for a second one. Now, this is my favorite tool. It's a bit and I was horrified. <laughs> I was horrified looking at the report that no yeah. one uses it. We yeah. do have, I know of some customers that do, but they're uh, not in this report. And that's because they do a very small program that doesn't classify as CPD, because there's not uh, proper CPD points for that. But it's internal communications, one that they do to make sure their staff are looking at it. But OK, this is, gets called the Big Brother tool. And it's really not this. And anyone who has Netflix and gets that message that, are you still watching? Same principle. So during your actual event or in the setup phase, you can choose to have a message pop up at any random timed interval. So we can see on the screen here in the box it says, please click OK to confirm your presence. This is set between every 10 to 17 minutes and we want to pop up audio sound as well. You can change all this to say, OK, you know what? Between every four and six minutes, I want that message to display. And it's going to come up on the screen. And if that person doesn't hit that OK button, their score starts to drop. And if their score gets below a certain point, like 80%, they now don't qualify for their CPD points because they weren't watching the screen. They could have just pressed play, muted their computer, walked away and done other work. There's no metric for you to tell that they were actually there. This gives you definitive proof that someone was online, they were paying attention, and if they have a score above 80%, they were extremely engaged. So that's how they qualify for their points. I think it's great, that tool. I, I love, love it. it. I just, <laughs> I think it's... people, organizers, every time we bring it up with them, they're just like, oh, no, no, I don't want to, it's too big brotherish. But it, how else do you know, especially for when people mm. are paying for points and credit for learning objectives, that's the only true I mean, that was when? my first question when we talked about online CPD events. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, I can just put it on and play it and walk away. Yeah. So with things like this, and especially when it's more important topics and for different industries, you definitely want to make sure that people are paying attention. Yes. So it's it's a very important tool to use indeed. But I think a lot of it also comes down to, um, as someone who's delivering this CPD, do you, as long as people, some people just think, okay, as long as they're online, as long yeah. as they're paying, 
that's that's what I care about. Whereas yeah. some other organisations might be okay. It really is about that user experience. Mm -hmm. And if I was someone paying for CPD and I was online and I was paying attention and I was writing everything down and I was making sure I got the most out of it, I would be thankful that something like that yeah. came up because then I'd be like, oh, well, I'm pressing yes and I'm yes. a bit of a nerd sometimes. <laughs> so I'd be like, oh, well, everyone else out there who's not putting as much effort into this as I am, they're going to get busted and this is great because, you know, yeah, I feel because quite good about myself now. It's a whole accountability thing as well. Yep. It's like, yep, I'm, I'm following it, I'm doing yep. it, like I'm... I'm meeting the objectives of I'm why I want this. Member ever. Ever. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, another thing as well um, is the in-room surveys. Yes. So I think um, no matter what type of webinar you run, I think no matter what type of platform you use, yes. gaining feedback is always hugely important. Yes. I think it's great for the members um, to be able to give their feedback to someone and feel like they're doing something. I feel it's great for us to actually go back, analyse that feedback, like you said, keep it consistent and maybe do some comparisons at the end of the year. But I think if you're going to collect this feedback, you need to do something with it. Yes. So I think that's the number one rule. But one of the things a lot of organisations do when it does come to these events is they run their session, it's great, they close down the platform, and then people get redirected mm -hmm. to a survey. Now, that's all great because you are, you know, are putting some, some effort in to actually collect that feedback. However, as we saw earlier, what about people who aren't staying for longer than 90% of the webinar? Yes. They're not then able to capture their feedback because they've got all they need. They don't really want to stay for the Q&A session and they're gone. Yeah. That's one way people do it and that's the issue with that. Yeah. The other thing is a lot of people have their event, they close it down. Afterwards, within 24 hours, they may send another email saying thank you for attending. By the way, click here to complete a survey. Yeah. Once again, you're doing great. You're going out there. You're trying to capture feedback. However, by then, it's not really fresh in someone's mind. So you will actually find the conversion rates drop. And by then, it's like, okay, well, 20 other things have happened to me yeah. since that webinar sure. happened. You know, even last night when I got home and I was doing this, this and this, that webinar is so far beyond me right now. Yeah. The last thing I feel like doing is to sit there and try and think back, you know, 24 hours yeah. ago to see what I enjoyed or what I didn't enjoy. The solution an in-room survey. Yes. Yes. So this is a great way to capture it. And you will actually, we've seen a 60% increase in our own personal events that we run when we have in-room surveys. So you'll notice um, today in the platform, and if you could click on the tab, the survey tab, that would be great and complete the survey so we can have some feedback. What you can actually do is as an, a webinar organiser, you can actually even split the screen within this yes. automatically within a platform sometimes. So that actually means that I can have the PowerPoint up or I can have a webcam up and I can have the survey up at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then as a facilitator, I'm saying to people, Hi, everyone. Just making sure that you're getting your feedback from this. Mm. This is going to help us improve our programs moving forward. Perhaps you can put a little opt-in or call to action there as well. Mm -hmm. And that gives you that feedback. It's instantaneous. It's in there. Maybe you can give some people an incentive to actually complete it. But then what it also allows you to do, use that exit page. So when you close down and you send people somewhere else, yep. use that for something else. Use that to promote your upcoming mm -hmm. events. Use it for something else that is going to give you another added benefit. In the recording email as well, you now have that extra space where there is no survey, so then you can start to use that to your marketing potential as well. So a few reasons to use in-room surveys. I'm a huge fan of them. I think they're great. Um, and like I said, if, if nothing else, just use them to increase your conversion rates yeah. because you will see an increase in conversions. Just with that one as well, I think people forget that you don't have to just have one. Yeah. You can have multiple in-room surveys. And it's a good opportunity at the very beginning of it as an organizer, you can launch one at the very beginning of your session to find out more information about the actual um, the, the program that you're running. It doesn't have to be about it. You've got your audience online there. So maybe at the beginning, it's like halfway through your program. Hey, guys, we're launching a survey right now about how you're finding the webinar experience, the journey, the sessions that we're running. And then you can do the one at the very end about the actual topic. You can have multiple ones of these to mm. engage with. Great. Yeah, it's definitely a good idea to do that. And just a reminder for the audience as well, if you have any questions about any of the features or anything that we've mentioned today, please do ask us in the chat box. We are more than happy to answer any of those questions. So what about people that are already running CPD events? How do we blend all of this so there is no confusions? People still want face-to-face, -face, right? But online is just an extra resource. So can we just talk at that, about that a little bit as well? Oh, God. Like, it's never going to replace face-to-face. -face. And like yeah. this isn't meant to replace face-to-face. -face. You want to have both of these, yes. but you want both of them to be aligned. And I know we keep saying aligned a lot in this, but you do. You need but to have <laughs> both strategies because they both feed into each other at your physical events. And I get, let's get you really to talk more about the graph mm. that you created. Yeah, so within here, this is just... Um, 
a quick summary of what we're talking yeah. about. So within the middle, you've got your CPD. You've got the benefits inside, which I think we all know, but it's good to be reminded of because yeah. the benefits for each organisation running CPD are going to be different to yes. each other. So maybe it's for cost savings and efficiency. Maybe it's for that global reach and you want to reach those members in areas where you can't usually reach them with these face-to-face -face events. Yeah. Maybe it's access and delivery. So you have, you have the ability to access speakers who deliver these events, yes. who can be anywhere in the world. Or maybe it is because you want that on-demand content. So I think it's important that we always remember what the benefits are and what the, how they're different to those in a face-to-face -face yes. environment or your physical events. So one of the um, great things about this blended approach and how we can work with it is the ability to remarket. So we touched on this earlier. And what this means is we're cross-promoting through different channels. So as an organiser of CPD, I have my physical events, which are face-to-face -face events. What I can then do is promote my online events at these events. Yep. and vice versa. One of the things I will recommend is when you are getting people to register for online events, keep it online. So, for example, if I'm at a physical event and I get down on my chair and there's a piece of paper there and it says go to this link, oh, that link's too way too long. I'm mm. not going to be able to type that in. really can't be bothered. I've got to get back to work. Have a QR code or something. Or yep. maybe when people are actually registering for that face-to-face -face, face -face event, let people know, by the way, did you know we also do... Um, online events as well. So if yeah. you can't attend, maybe, you know, next time take a look at these events. The other thing, um, like we're talking about now, is that blended approach as well. So maybe you are having face-to-face -face events. You can actually get a videographer and stream them live as yes. well. So it's not just about having a presenter mm sit behind a computer screen and being able to talk. It is a little bit more of an investment to actually do a live stream, yeah. but then think about you're only having to, you're killing two birds with one stone. Yeah. You've got that event happening. However, you've then got the ability to take it online and that other benefit of on-demand content yes. also comes into it. Um, the customer experience as well, the customer X, like this is always so important and I feel like people are asking for something give it to them or at least try to give it to them as best as you can. And do you know what? It might not work for everyone. Maybe yep. your um, members out there who are your customers are just like, well, do you know what? This isn't really working for us. It's not the sort of environment that we want to learn in. Yeah. But we've tried it maybe face-to-face -to, -face to events are much more better for us. Or maybe you're not getting that live attendance. So maybe what you do is just do on-demand content and then push out afterwards. Um, and then the registration process as well. So that really goes into that remarketing piece. So that's really about using your registration process to collect that data. The people at your face-to-face -face events may be registered. They didn't turn up. Maybe you use that data to actually promote your online events because maybe that might be why they didn't show up in the first place. So just a bit of a, an overview of how that blended approach yeah. works. Most nice. definitely. And just speaking of registration, how would you recommend going about registration? What kind of fields would we use and... Is question. that the same as normal events? <laughs> that or? is a really good question yeah. because I did see, and this was um, years ago when webinars first came into um, even like vocabulary, I guess. It was um, an organisation who started to run their own webinars and they had their field. So it was like, you know, first name, surname, organisation, dietary requirements. requirements. Oh. <laughs> I was like, I'm attending a webinar. But because you just, you're on autopilot yeah, so much. And if you're running events on a regular basis, yes. and this goes into that creating a plan at the beginning, start thinking about these little things and these little tweaks. And, you know, that's something so simple. But as a member, as someone who's registering, yeah. I'm just like, well... I'm just disengaged and that's the only thing I'm going to be thinking of. Yeah. Like, you obviously didn't think this through. It just comes across as a little bit not professional. But so. with your members as well, I still get calls from customers who tell us that they've they changed their registration process, they're going to try a digital event, and people show up their office thinking that they're doing a physical face-to-face. -face. Oh. It yeah. still happens today. Yeah. People just, they go on autopilot, they've all, like, they're... Their organisation has always been doing physical mm. events, so they register for this digital one, not realising that they want to be behind their computer, and they show up at the office mm, for the actual event. Just never assume. Yeah, yeah never assume. It comes <laughs> to field. And I think always remember that you may, have, a lot of organisations, we've had customers who have been running webinars for six years and have won global awards for them. Yeah. However, some of those people who are joining their events now, it's their first time joining a webinar, and they're not okay, used yeah. to technology. So it doesn't matter how long you've been running them for, always assume that the person who's least tech savvy, who has no idea what a webinar is or can't even say it, is the person joining. And I think then you'll be safe. Yeah, yeah. most definitely. And I think you can really be smart about the registration fields that you use, as you mentioned earlier as well. So say if you're talking about CPD, maybe it's really easy to fix this and you can sort of say, have you ever done a CPD event before and mm. just have a yes or no so you get an idea of who your audience is and why yeah. they're joining and then you can really yeah. create your content to what your audience is saying to you. 
So it's just all about creating more engaging things mm. and things that work with your audience. Definitely. Yeah. Um, one of the things we just want to touch on before we end, um, yeah, I think this is important because we did talk about making money. Yes. Um, however, it's not just about making money through charging people for these events. No, and it's not. I think um, a lot of associations out there have a lot of opportunities to gain sponsors for their yes. physical events. Bring them online. Well, that's it. And I think it's, a, uh, it's such a big missed opportunity because yeah. you look at the physical events that you're running for your face-to-face -face programs and your face-to-face -face CBD, and you get sponsors for that. A lot of organizations do associations because they're expensive events to run. Your sponsor's benefit for doing one of those CBD days is one day's of exposure and maybe a handout on the seat, a banner up in the back of the room. You have a potential sponsor who sponsors a webinar or a webcast or just your CBD program. That on-demand exposure lives for the life of the content. So it's all their branding there. You can create call to actions. You're giving them a lot more value for that investment because that exposure goes a lot further. And it also gives them exposure to your entire uh, membership database, which might be extremely relevant to them and what they're trying to tap into. So you've got a lot of leverage there that you can play around with. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. And they're just some examples of how yeah. they can be done on the online platform. There's also, um, in the resources folder, there's uh, some links to some other pieces of content that you can take a look at. And one of them is a sponsorship guide. So it's actually step-by-step -step how you can gain sponsorship for your webinars um, and your sort of programs you're running as well. So that might be useful for some of you out there. Definitely. Yeah, um oh. Sorry, Sorry, I was going to just say, um, yeah, some of our customers, they don't charge for their uh, CBD programs at all because they have a sponsor who picks up the bill for the entire thing. Mm. Wow, yeah. So the, the member value is that they don't get charged for their training, but the organization isn't paying anything for it either. They're having an external party pay for it. So it's a neutral cost for them. Yeah, mm. most definitely. At the beginning of the webcast as well, we touched on how um, sourcing presenters, you can do that through sponsorship as well. And there's just so many benefits from working with another organization, getting new ideas, you get more content, more presenters. It's just a really good way mm. of mixing it up a little bit and just, yeah, providing more value for your members. Great. Um, so if there's any questions from the audience, please do feel free to send them through. And as Sarah mentioned before as well, please uh, fill out the in-room survey as well. It's just a really good source of feedback for us. Um, and if, yeah, if we don't have any more questions, we might just wrap it up yeah. here. Uh, thank you, and Sarah, thank you, Sarah and Michael. There was so much valuable information and insights into running effective CPD programs. If you would like any other information on how you can take your programs online, please feel free to visit our website or contact us directly. Thank you very much for attending today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.